Hey everyone, it's your cruel man of RPG, CJ here, bringing you the firearm episode of the How to Play Call of Cthulhu series. As always, you can use the timestamp to get around the different topics in the episode. But before we start the video, I have to thank the good folks at Amino for sponsoring this episode. Amino has just launched their new story feature and you can watch tons of cool short videos on it. I have also created my own exclusive story, Tabletop RPG Flash Tip. It is easy, short, fast tips you can use to clarify rules in the middle of a game. Just search for my name CJ Leung and you can find my video. Download the Amino app and tell me what you guys think about these flash tips. Is this going to be the future of tabletop RPG tutorial? I will make more if you guys like it. Anyway, back to the episode. A lot of the terms covered here are quite advanced and you might get lost if you haven't watched the previous two episodes, basic rules and combat. I even had to ask Mike Mason, the editor of Call of Cthulhu for some clarification while making this episode. So if you haven't seen those, I highly recommend that you pause this video and jump into them before continuing. You can use the series playlist link in the description below. But if you're caught up, then let us dive into the madness. Continuing the story from the last episode, Lucille and friends saved Rosalind from a group of cultists and a mysterious ghoul of unknown origin. With her expertise in the antiquities on their side, they were able to decipher the significance of the smuggled antiques in the mob's ledger and the location where they are hidden. Apparently, there is something very, very precious hidden in an abandoned warehouse outside the city. Call of Cthulhu is not a game that tracks your possessions. If it is reasonable for your investigators to own a gun, then you can definitely bring them with you. Phineas, being a veteran of the First Great War, brought with him his trusty Lee Einfeld rifle. Meanwhile, Lucille has her .22 short automatic handgun. Despite her frail and delicate exterior, she is actually quite a great shot, she boasts. She would even go as far as to claim she is quite gangster with her handgun. <coughs> there are three different classifications of projectile weapons, firearm, missile, and throne. It is easy to get your head around firearms. They are just guns, pistols, rifles, and so on. Like fighting skills, there are many different specialized firearm skills in Call of Cthulhu. There is one for handgun, one for rifles and shotguns, submachine gun is for Thompson and Uzis, machine gun is for Gatling and miniguns, and there are many other firearm skills. You can find the base skills for these various firearm skills in the rulebook. Thrown weapons uses the throw skill. They include spears, rocks, and even grenades. Missile weapons doesn't mean rockets. It is a classification for weapons like bows, crossbows, and slings. It lays awkwardly between the two other classifications. It uses the weapon-specific firearm skill, like firearm bow. When it is shot, it is too fast to dodge, so the target has to die for cover. But it takes time to shoot, so if the attacker tries to shoot it at a range that's too close to the target, the target can fight back. But remember, the point of Call of Cthulhu is not about big guns and killing your enemies. It is about the mystery, horror, and the brilliant ad hoc solutions. For example, before coming here, Lucille had made a phone call to the police and conned them into thinking that the mob had kidnapped some damsels in distress and is holding them hostage in their headquarters. Rosalind turned out to be especially brilliant in the park. What was her secret? Lucille asked. She didn't tell her at the time, but the fact is, she is always in distress. What is that open bottle of red anyway? So by now, they should be too distracted by the police to guard their secret stash. But still, you should never be too careful. After reprimanding Lucille and telling her that gangster is not an adjective and shooting sideways will never catch on, Phineas made her and Scott stand guard outside the building. While accompanying Rosalind with her search for the artifact, he saw something curious through the window. A speeding car pursued by a police car is making its way to their location. The mob boss must have gotten suspicious of the sudden police raid and decided to check on their stash personally. Phineas wanted to take out this threat before it becomes real danger and pointed the rifle towards the car. 
the car is 400 yards away, which is beyond two times of his weapon's base range. So that would be considered a very long range shot, which means that to succeed, he has to roll extreme success, and to cause extreme impale damage, he has to roll critical success. So he is going to wait for them to come closer to make the shot easier. But he realized that the mob had actually set up an ambush and two thugs are about to attack Lucille and Scott. He alerted the two just in time and combat starts. The thing about firearms is that it is very quick and easy to shoot. So investigators who have their guns ready get 50 points bonus to their turn order as long as their action involves shooting with their gun first. Gunfights are really dangerous. A bullet can't be actively dodged. In other words, you can't spend a chunk of luck at a critical moment to survive a shot that's going to hit you. But there are ways to reduce the chance of getting hit and hitting your target. This is the bonus and penalties chart. It summarizes the various conditions that will grant shooters bonus or penalty dice. There is a similar chart in the rulebook, and knowing this will help your investigators survive gunfights. Due to the bonus from his reddit gun, Phineas starts the round. But unfortunately, his targets are just outside his gun's base range, so he has to make a long-range shot. To make sure that he hits his target, he spends his turn aiming, which means that he can shoot at the target he is aiming at with the bonus die on his next turn. He aims for the thug closest to Lucille. No offense Scott, but he has his priorities. Next is Thug A's turn. He shoots at Scott. Targets getting shot at cannot fight back. They can either do nothing or die for cover. Scott has not recovered any hit points for the last few days due to his major wound. So he really can't afford to get hurt again. To succeed at diving for cover, the target needs to succeed their dodge roll. Once succeeded, it will apply a penalty die to the shooter's firearm roll. Scott would also have cover for subsequent attacks. So other attackers will also make their shots with penalty dice. However, diving for cover comes with a hefty cost. Characters who attempted to dive will forfeit their action on their next turn, whether they succeed or not. This is due to the frantic nature of the dive. Combat in Call of Cthulhu is done in the theater of the mind. Usually, we just assume that there is always some sort of cover nearby. But of course, keepers can decide that there are no suitable covers anywhere in the location, just to be excessively cruel. Now comes Lucille's turn. Handgun usually deals less damage and has less range than rifle, but they can usually be shot more times in a turn. Let's look at the statistics of the handgun she's using. Right next to the one uses per round number is a 3. When you see a weapon with a number in parentheses, it means that it can be shot up to that number of times in a turn, so Lucille can shoot up to 3 times in her turn but making multiple shots will apply a penalty die on each shot. Her first shot barely hits the gun-wielding thug A. If she wants to counteract the penalty dice, she can easily move closer to her target and shoot him within her point-blank range. A character's point-blank range is their dexterity divided by 5 feet, so 12 feet for Lucille. Since she is pretty close to the thug, she can easily do that. After dispatching Thug A, she proceeds to shoot Thug B in her point blank range. The drawback of shooting at point blank range is that on the target's next turn, the target can choose to use his or her fighting maneuver to disarm the shooter. Scott cannot do anything on his turn because he dove for cover. So on his turn, Thug B tries to disarm Lucille. When a gunner is being attacked in melee, he or she is engaged in melee combat. Like usual, the investigator can fight back, but not shoot with her gun. To quote Mike Mason, the editor of Call of Cthulhu, once you have engaged in melee, your firearm is far more useful as a lump of heavy metal. So you can't shoot, but you can smack people with it. Lucille has the turn order bonus and she gets to go first if she decides to shoot. But as she is engaged in melee, she would have to shoot with a penalty die. If she fumbles, she might even shoot herself. So she wants to get out of the way, but to do that, she would have to wait for her normal turn order, since she is not shooting with her gun. To get out of melee, she needs to succeed her dodge roll on her normal turn. So Phineas gets to go first. Since he was aiming to shoot, on this turn, he gets to shoot at the target he was aiming at with the bonus die. But since his target is engaged in melee, 
he would get a penalty die, which counteracts his bonus die. If he fumbles his roll, he would hit an ally engaged in melee. In this case, it would be Lucille. The mob boss and his right hand man has engaged the police in a gunfight nearby. Not wanting to prolong the fight, he took the risk and made the shot. Success! Killed him in one shot. Extreme impale damage. Meanwhile, at the other side of the battlefield, the mob boss Reggie Rosso and his right hand man Benny Bambino is plowing through the meat shield. I mean, the poor police officers. It is Benny's turn with his shotgun. Shotguns pack a powerful punch at close range, but not so much at long distance. Also, since it does scatter shot, instead of losing accuracy, it loses its damage power the further away the gunner is from the target. He missed his first attack, but shotguns have double barrels. Look at the number of uses per round here for shotguns. It says 1 or 2 instead of a 2 in parentheses. It means that certain shotguns, like this one, can make up to 2 shots per turn. Penalty die applies as usual when making multiple shots at different targets. But if both shots are made on the same target, it is made without any penalties. BAM! Extreme damage. Benny did a maximum total of 24 damage. Normal shotgun pellets do not do impale damage, but even most Eldritch Abominations won't survive this kind of punishment. Rosso wields the classic gangster weapon of the 20s, a Thompson submachine gun. It can be shot as a single round or as full auto. The rules for full auto is quite complex, so you can follow these four steps as a guide. First, the shooter determines the number of bullets they want to fire. It could be four up to every single round in the magazine. Second, determine the volley size. Instead of calculating each shot individually, the bullets are grouped in volleys. Minimum number of bullets in a volley is four, up to the gunner's submachine gun skill divided by 10 and rounded down. Reggie Rosso's skill is 55, so he can make 5 bullet volleys. Third, pick the targets within the gunner's 60 degree angle, decide how many volleys you want to spend at each of them, and determine their distance relative to each other. You need to get the keeper to help come up with the distance so that you can know how much bullets you are wasting moving between each target. Once you are done, you can start making your skill checks. The first volley is made without any penalties. If it hits, it does the damage of half the bullets rounded down. So two bullets hit the first target and killed him. If the target has any armor, reduce the damage for each bullet. The second volley is made with one penalty die, but it is wasted as the target had already died. Moving on to the next target, one bullet is wasted per yard as the gun is kept firing. This doesn't count as a volley. The third volley is made with two penalty dice. Luckily, he got extreme success and he does extreme volley damage. It means that all the bullets in the volley hits the target and half of the bullets rounded down will do impale damage. Instead of adding another penalty die, the fourth volley is made with hard difficulty. More bullets are wasted as he moves to another target. The fifth volley is made with two penalty dice and extreme difficulty. At this stage, extreme impale damage will not occur. The sixth volley is made with two penalty dice and the critical difficulty. After that, it is impossible to hit. As you can see, the full auto rules is complex, deadly, and grinds everything to a halt whenever it is used. But it is not meant to be regularly used anyway. It is best reserved as a final trump card for your investigators against some eldritch abominations or for keepers to TVK unruly investigators. Pro tip, when you see an enemy with one of these, just run. On another note, before we move on, let's spend a few moments to show our gratitude to these selfless boys in blue. A countless numbers of them have died in countless Call of Cthulhu campaigns so that your investigators can live for another session. So be kind to them whenever you meet them. Reggie and Benny approaches Lucille and Scott. Combat starts again. Lucille has her gun ready, but getting into a gunfight with them is plain suicide. But she can't just run away, she has to create a distraction or they will target the already wounded Scott. To do that, she has to take her action without the firearm turn bonus. Lucky for them, it appears that Reggie and Benny are going to reload. But the two of them will have to do it on their turn on their usual dexterity order. Phineas tries to shoot, but he rolled his weapon's malfunction range. He fumbled too. In this case, the keeper can choose either result. 
but mercifully, I am treating it as normal malfunction. He has to spend 1d6 rounds and use his mechanical repair or firearm skill to fix it. Different guns has different malfunction rules, so you can look it up in the book. Lucille ran away at full speed and shoot at the two. She wants to make them die for cover and waste their next turn. Measuring distance is part of the optional rule. I don't want to go too deep into it, but this is a gist of how it works. On your turn, you can move up to your movement rate number of yards and attack without any penalty. Or you can move up to full speed, covering up to 5 times your movement rate in yards, but attacks will be made with penalty die. Lucille shoots both of them, with two penalty dies each. One for moving at full speed, and the other for attacking multiple targets. Rosso is not going to take this risk, so he dove for cover. And he can't do anything on his next turn. Benny is risking it and is not diving for cover. But unlike melee combat, there is no bonus to hit an enemy who is not doing anything. With two penalty dice, Lucille naturally misses her shot. On Benny's turn, he is going to reload. There are actually two reload options. Normal reload takes one round to replace a clip or load two bullets or two shells. The other option allows him to reload only one bullet and shoot on the same turn. But it is done with a penalty die. Because Lucille is running at full speed, Benny gets another penalty die, causing him to miss. On his turn, Scott just books it. On the next round, Lucille ditched him and ran for the building. In Call of Cthulhu, combat is not the solution to everything. If they were to go all out, there is a minuscule possibility that they might win. But at what cost? Many investigators will get utterly destroyed in the process. And there is no such thing as reviving the dead in this game. So rather than risking it, it's time to get creative. To pile on the pressure on our investigator, Phineas's rifle has malfunctioned and Lucille is out of bullets. The only other exit out of the building is a long fall down a cliff. Hmm, but it seems that this cliff is created by a recent landslide. So... Using her appraisal skill, Rosalind was able to uncover some antique crossbows, spears, and armor pieces. Using these, they launched their counterattack by first ambushing Benny. Rosalind charged at him. She tried to get a point-blank bonus against him using a crossbow, but she got too close and is within Benny's point-blank range, which is his dexterity divided by 5 feet. At this range, Benny can actually fight back with his melee attack against missile or thrown weapons. And he succeeds. Full body armor reduces incoming damage from all sides. But Rosalind is only wearing a helmet, so she would receive the protection of her piecemeal armor only if she successfully rolled her luck. There are optional rules that allow you to determine hit location in the rulebook, but it is up to you whether you want to implement it. Scott was careful enough to throw his spear from a distance. The base range of thrown weapons is the investigator's strength divided by 5 numbers of yards. It landed on his target, doing d8 and half damage bonus. How a half damage bonus is calculated is not written in the book, but in forums, Mike Mason had clarified that d4s are treated as d2s and d6s are treated as d3s. For negative bonuses, minus 2 becomes minus 1 and minus 1 becomes 0. Scott landed a solid hit and killed him. At the other side of the building, Lucille is being hunted by Reggie. He was sure that she had run towards this direction, so he charged through the door and plunges into the newly created cliff that he never knew was there. Little did he know that Lucille faked the sound of her footsteps with her dance skill. But hey, that's creative solution for you. To make sure that the job is finished, Lucille gave Scott a grenade, which she had found in the stash. Scott threw the nade. It missed, but not by much. When a thrown object misses a target, it lands at a random distance from the target. But the keeper should compare the result to the highest number that would indicate success and decide where it lands. There is no science to this, because Reggie is outside the base damage radius but not over twice the damage radius, he only takes half the damage. Now they can find this cultist treasure the mob tried so hard to protect. In peace. But we will continue our story next episode. Keep in mind that I cannot cover everything in the rulebook, so if you want to know all the nitty gritty rules, you will have to read it yourself. Remember that you can help the channel by using the affiliate links below and also by getting the series merchandise. Anyway, don't forget to subscribe for the next episode, Insanity. CJ, over and out.